I tell people, if you want to know where you are or what port you're on, look in your cell phone. Because your cell phone will tell me who you talk to. And whoever you spend your time talking to, that's the port you're on. You cannot surround yourself with blindness and expect to see. You cannot run with packs of angry women and expect to be happy and fulfilled. You cannot hang out with a bunch of defeated, going nowhere, no vision men and be an overcomer. You are who you hang around. You're praying for something that God already answered with. You pray for a tree, God doesn't send you a tree, he gives you a seed. You pray for prosperity, God's not going to send money, he gives you a thought. A thought, an agriculture, a seed, he plants a seed. And if you can bring the seed out of your thought life into fruition, then you will see seed time and harvest. See, a seed only works when you plant it. It requires action. It cannot bring life as long as you store it. Your stored thoughts is where your money is, is where your future is, is where your productivity is, is where your best marriage is, is where your greatest thought is, is in the things that are in your head that need to get out the shelf of your mind and be planted in the soil of your life. And God is going to do an agriculture. He's going to cause it to grow in spite of its environment, in spite of its surrounding. He will cause it to stand out and be able to grow. You could take my suit. I got another one. You could take my car. I could get another one. You could take my house. I could get another house. Uh, but when you take my time, you have taken something from me that is totally irreplaceable. We take all kind of classes for money management. We, we know how to manage our money. We know how to repair our houses. We're working on our hair and our bodies and all of this kind of stuff. We do everything except the most important thing is to value our time. It takes time to be creative. You were meant to be creative. You were created in the likeness and the image of a creator. And in that likeness and in that image, you have creativity. If you had time, you would be creative. People torment themselves by how they see their life. They've told themselves a story as if it were the truth when it is really a perspective truth. And sometimes you've narrated a story that you beat yourself to death with. Challenge your own story. Change the way you talk to yourself about who you are and what happened to you and what you're going to do in your life. You, you wrote the script. Change the story. If you are waiting for your feelings to line up with your decisions, your life will always be on hold. You don't have to ask your emotions to give you permission to be who you were created to be. Everybody has some angst, some fear, some negative voice saying, who are you? But some people rebuke it <laughs> and other people birth it. The difference between rebuking it and birthing it is how long you nurture the thought. The thought comes like a seed in the womb of your mind. You can either incubate it, carry it through three trimesters, and birth it in your failure. Or you can say, this is not mine. It's not on my agenda. I reject it. If you're truly going to be exceptional, if you're truly going to be radical, you have to be willing to stand out. You have to be willing to be hated. You have to be willing to be controversial. You have to be willing to have certain people talking about you and you walk in the room and all the conversation talks, you have to be okay with that. Because if you're a radical, that's going to happen. Do you know how long I was doing almost everything before I got to the point of walking into the conference when everything was already set up and walking into the church when everything was already set up? Do you know how many commodes I cleaned and carpet I cleaned and, and pulpits I helped build before I got to the point that I could walk in with a nice suit on? You know, when you start a business, you can't hit the glamour trail whatever it is you have to roll up your sleeves and get down it was horrifying to me the first time i heard somebody because i, I didn't mind living by faith but to put somebody else out there it scared me to death because because in ministry you don't know 
It could go either way. You don't know whether people are coming. You don't. See, it's not like you're selling a product. You don't know whether people are going to give. Y'all can decide, you know, we're not coming tonight. Or you can say we're coming, we ain't giving. I still got to pay 350 people. <laughs> That's stressful. We had a multi-million dollar budget for Woman Are Loose. Before the first woman walked in the door, the arena has to be paid up front. The sound people have to be paid up front. The, the, the trucks have to be paid up front. The equipment has to be paid up front. The satellite time has to be paid up front. The, the volunteers' hotel rooms have to be paid. The per diems have to be paid. And on and on and on and on and on. The plane tickets have to be paid for. The hotel wants the money up front. The caterer wants his money up front. The stage designer wants it. All of that's paid up front. Profit. Somebody say profit. You are in business for profit. Don't be confused about that. You're in business for profit. Not because you have a warm feeling, because if you have a warm feeling and that's the thing that motivated you, you need to go into social services. No, this is true. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You must make money in business or you will not be in business long. Even if your business is a ministry to people, this is a ministry to people. But if we don't make a certain profit level, it will not be a ministry. When you come in here and the air condition is off and the lights are off and there's no sound system, and if that, then it will cease to be a ministry. And even though we have a good philosophy and we love the Lord, we have bills to pay. And there is a practical side to ministry that's unavoidable. And there's a practical side to your company. And the fact that you're here as a business owner, it frees you a lot more than a ministry is because you can unashamedly, unabashedly say, I need to make some money up in here. We can't flat out say that because people don't like to hear you say that. But on the other hand, they don't want to come in here in no hot building with the lights out and the pews broken down. There's no excuse for poor marketing today. You can do marketing from your phone. This is ridiculous. I don't understand this Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. What you don't understand is killing you. Get out and practice it. Baby boomers, get out and practice it. Figure it out. There's a whole world of people that want to connect with you over the Internet. It doesn't take a lot of money to do it. You don't have to have a lot of graphic arts design. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be relevant. People can't find your business. You are not there. They're not looking in the yellow pages anymore. They're not reading it in the newspaper anymore. They're not going to drive by and discover your business. Get up off the seat and do nothing and do something exciting about what you're doing. You can do it on a budget. You have no excuse not to be exceptional. The Bible says that we have to spend, we have to have two scrub brushes. <laughs> One of them has to be scrubbing our hearts, our attitudes, our dispositions so that we don't get bitter. It wouldn't tell you to watch out for bitterness if you weren't going to be confronted with things that could make you bitter. No need in writing a scripture about something I'm not going to confront. It is warning you that life will tempt you to become bitter. Age will make you bitter. Because during age, you collect enough experiences to become cynical till after a while, you don't expect anything good to happen because you've been through so many bad things that if anybody comes knocking at your door, you're predisposed to think it's something evil. You have to be careful lest you become bitter. Either your troubles make you better or they make you bitter. I believe this was part of Peter's problem. When he saw the power of God to bless him, he recognized the power of God to destroy him. Think about that. When he saw the power of God to bless him, he recognized the power of God to destroy him. He said, get out of here, Jesus. Depart from me. Why? Because I know I've got imperfections. And I don't want to get in the light because somebody might see them. And so I'm going to be secretly talented. I'm going to sing at home. I'm going to leave the church and say what they ought to do and what somebody ought to say and what somebody ought to write a book about that and somebody ought to get up and say something. And I'm going to drive home locking my treasure up inside of me because I am imprisoned by my imperfections and I don't want anybody to know that I'm not perfect even though I'm good at this, I'm weak at that. Peter said, look, you've made me a great fisherman but I'm a sinful man, go. 
I reject the opportunity to be blessed because I know something about myself that I don't want anybody else to know. And I'm more concerned about the security of my reputation than I am my progress. Over and over again in the book of Ephesians, it tells us that we are accepted in the beloved. When you know you're accepted in the beloved, it changes your whole mental behavior. Your whole psychological disposition is altered by the fact that you are accepted in the beloved. I think half of the problems that we have with church folk today is that the church folk today don't study the word. They don't study the word. We would need so much support. We would need so much help. We would need so much counseling if people got in the word of God. All of these dysfunctions and emotional breakdowns where you're running around trying to find out where you fit. The devil is a lie. If you had a good Bible study, you would know where you fit. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm created in the Christ Jesus under good works. And I'm going to tell you, frankly, it doesn't matter to me whether you accept me or not. I'm accepted in the beloved. Oh my God, when you know who you are in Christ, it changes your whole disposition and your entire philosophy. I'm accepted. No, you didn't hear me. I didn't say I hope to be accepted. I didn't say I'm going to be accepted when I get to heaven. I didn't say I'm going to be accepted at the judgment seat of Christ. Accepted is past tense. I am already accepted in the beloved. When Christ went into heaven, he took me with him. And I'm already seated in heaven and places in Christ Jesus. I'm accepted. God's not trying to make up his mind. He's not waiting on the jury to come in. I am accepted in the beloved. And so if the world never accepts me, it doesn't make any difference at all. I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep. Oh, my God. I wish y'all would help me in here. Accepted.